All right. Second Timothy chapter three. First Timothy. There we go. Second uh, Timothy chapter three. We're going to pick up. Uh, we'll start reading verse fifteen. And uh, the Bible says, "And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus." All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We're going to take um, mainly in focus this time on just that two-letter phrase in verse 16, all Scripture. Lord, I thank you for this day and everything that you've blessed us with. Thank you for your word, the gift that it is to us. We thank you for this time that we get to spend in it, gathered together. I just pray that you open our hearts and our minds to understand what you have for us, that we would be willing to submit ourselves to your truth and learn from it. Please help us in the areas where we need it tonight and strengthen us. It's in Christ and I pray. Amen. Okay, so Timothy's writing, or Paul's writing here to a young man named Timothy. Timothy is a pastor at this time, coming up along kind of under Paul's uh, leadership there, serving with him. And Paul writes a couple letters to Timothy, and here in this chapter, He's going to call us back to some things, and and we're wanting to spend this time just to talk about the importance of Scripture. When we think about, uh, we're going to look at it some in chapter 3, just the direction the world is heading. Um, We need the Word of God. It's so fitting that Paul brings it in here, and we'll get back to the rest of chapter 3. But Paul comes in verse 15, and he says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. He says, Timothy, from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures. And, and one of the things we want to think about as we think of the need for all Scripture and the importance of all Scripture is at this time, obviously, this is part of the New Testament. And so when we go back to when Timothy was a child, he didn't have Matthew through Revelation set out for him. Okay, what he had, he would have had the Old Testament. He would have had the Law and the Prophets. And, and Paul here, of course, calls him Scripture. Jesus calls him Scripture. Peter calls him Scripture in 1 Peter. And we could go through that um, and spend a lot of time there. But Paul says, from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures. And that's he's talking an Old Testament Scripture there. He says, Timothy, from a child you have known the Old Testament Scriptures. What we would call the Old Testament. But he says, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. When we think about the Old Testament, I was just talking to someone at work this morning. And they said, I don't like the Old Testament very much because it's just a bunch of law stuff. And I get what they're saying. There are some parts, you know, First Chronicles, it's like the first seven chapters are just names. That's difficult to read. But Paul says here to Timothy, he says, that from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so what we find is, as Paul is writing and he's speaking to Timothy, what we can't take away from, and so many people like to do it today, is to move from the Old Testament. It's not for today. We don't need it and turn to it. And, and they try to separate. There is the Old and New Testament, but the way God has worked and brought salvation about His plan for salvation, the New Testament only makes sense in light of the Old Testament. And we'll spend some time there. Jesus in the four Gospels is mostly where we find Jesus speaking as far as what you'll find in red letters in your Bible. Um, Jesus quotes the New Testament conservative um, guesstimates and there's some that he alludes to some Old Testament passages, but a hundred times Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, okay? When Jesus was tempted in Matthew 4 in the desert place, what did Jesus revert to to combat that temptation? He's quoting Deuteronomy. He's quoting Old Testament passages. He's going back and he's saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. He's quoting from Deuteronomy. And so many times we come to that same passage and we think, why do I need to read that? It's just a bunch of laws that don't apply to me today. But Jesus... It's the Word of God. And he took it and he used it uh, for himself. One thing that I should point out in Psalm 138, verse 2, if you can write that down, God says that he has exalted his Word. He's magnified his Word far above all his name. And as you track from Genesis to Revelation, all the names of God that he uses, what they mean, the context of them, God says, above all my name, I've magnified my Word. We can't overemphasize the Word of God as a whole. In and of itself, David I wish we had time to go through Psalm 119, but David there, he writes and he's talking about how much he loves God's Word, how much he delights in it, what it means to him, the desire that he has for it, all this. You know what David had at the time? The books of Moses. Leviticus, that bores us when we're reading it. You know, all those things. And David said, it's my delight. 
That's what I desire. I desire that. But so many times we come to it and we want to shove it away because, oh, it's just uh, not for me today. In Romans chapter 15, the Bible talks about how the things that were written before time, written for an example for us, written for our learning, so that we could know them and have hope. And then a few verses later, he says, Thou the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace and hope in believing. He says the Old Testament was given for our hope. And he says in believing, you can be filled with hope. What are we believing? We're believing the Old Testament Scripture. We're believing what God has done from the beginning of time and giving us from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We see in Revelation where God spoke to John, had him write some stuff down, and then God said, now eat it up. It wasn't for us. We didn't need to have that. But what we have preserved for us is both Old and New Testament that God's given to us. And they combine, they come together in the New Testament. I would say, I didn't study it too in depth, but I would say just about half the New Testament is just quotes from the Old Testament. You can see Paul, Peter, Jesus, they all do it. And not so much that, but even farther, all of it is just expounding on the Old Testament Scriptures, right? On the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, as Jesus is walking with some of the disciples, he says that he began at Moses and the prophets and went through the law and the prophets, expounding to them the things that spoke of him. Right? And we look at it, man, what in the world? But when we come back, even back to Genesis 3, the seed of the woman is promised. Who was that? That was Jesus who would crush the serpent's head. We see where Abraham looks at Isaac and he says, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. And we see that fulfilled when John points to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. God provided literally himself as our lamb. We see the sacrifices in the Old Testament. We see the red heifer who was taken out of the city, out of the gate, slain. We see the scapegoat that was the atonement, the substitute. All those things that we see, it all points to Christ. We see um, Philip on the road um, as he's walking in, he comes across the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch, he's reading from Isaiah 53. And Philip gets in, and he says, hey, here's what it's talking about. Here's who he's speaking of. It's talking to Christ. You can't get away from it. That The Old Testament, you, you can go through everything from Boaz uh, being the picture of the kinsman redeemer. You can go through all those pictures through all the Bible. You can see Christ, but you can see the prophecies. You can see all these things about who Christ was. And sadly, so many people today would come and find themselves in Philip's spot. And we would find someone reading Isaiah and they said, could you explain this to me? And so many of us today would be like, well, he's talking about Jesus. And in Romans it says, and in the Romans, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I kind of say that a little bit as a joke. But Philip was able to take the Old Testament scriptures. He knew what they pointed to. He didn't have to jump forward and, and not, he was wise in the scriptures. He knew what it was talking about and he was able to expound it. And, and we miss that so much today. But it says the scriptures, the Old Testament, it's able to make us wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. It calls us to faith in Christ. Right? As we look at all the things in scripture, everything that goes on, it is calling us to faith in Christ. And it's able to make us wise unto that. If we would submit ourselves to what the scriptures say, if we would learn it, take it in context, know it, if we would come to Isaiah 53 and just know what it's talking about, what is that doing? It's making us wise unto salvation through faith because it calls us to believe. Because we look at Isaiah 53 and all the other prophecies in Scripture from Zechariah about being pierced in the house of his friends, coming in on a donkey into the city, all those things that we see, the Old Testament prophesy of Christ, and then we see Christ fulfill them. And what does it do? It calls us to faith in him because he is the only one who fulfilled what God said would take place. But he says, from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make thee wise unto salvation. When we try uh, to distinguish and, and push the Old Testament and say, well, it's not for us, it calls us to some other sort of salvation, it doesn't. It calls us to faith in Christ. Everything that we see points to Christ. Just as we look back to Christ and what he did, it was those people looking forward to that promise of what Christ would do. We're looking back, they're looking forward, but it's still faith. It's still believing on Jesus Christ and what he's done. And so verse 16 he says, all Scripture, what did we establish in verse 10, 15, the Scriptures were? He's talking about Old Testament there. And of course, we know for us today that New Testament is Scriptures, but he says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration. Proverbs says that every word of God is pure. The, the Word, 
right? We don't want just a phrase, um, you know, a similar phrase. Every word of God is pure. It's his word that he gave us. We see in John 1 where Jesus is the word made flesh dwelling among us. If we begin to try to make changes to the word, we're really changing Christ and vice versa. And it's the word of God that we hold to. He says all scripture is given by inspiration. It's God breathed. God spoke it out. God had it written forever settled in heaven, the Bible says. And he spoke it to these men. And uh, Peter, he says, holy men of old wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. David said uh, that the word of God was in his mouth as he wrote there. And inspiration is that by which God delivers his message to us today. And what we have in our hand or on the pulpit here in front of me, the word of God was given by inspiration. He says all scripture, not just the parts we like, not just the parts that make the most sense to us, not just the parts that fit with the things that get in our crawl. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He says all scripture. What do you mean by all scripture? Even those seven chapters of Chronicles that are just names? It's profitable. It's profitable for these things. Um, I heard a story and I'll share it real quick. There was a pastor who had been after this guy for years and years and years. Come to church, come to church, come to church. And um, the guy just wouldn't come, wouldn't come. Finally, he got this man to come to church. But it happened to be the Sunday that the pastor was going through that passage in Chronicles. Or just all these people. So-and-so, he lived such and such, and he died. So-and-so lived such and such, and he died. And the pastor thought, of all the times that this guy could come to church, and this is the passage that I have. And he thought about changing it, but he thought, no, I'll just preach, because that's where I'm at. He preached through that message, or just about, hey, this guy, this guy, and he gets down after the hour sermon, and he dismisses everybody, and that man comes to him, and he wants to get saved. The man gets saved. And he said, what? You know, and he began to talk to him. He said, well, as I sat there and I heard you say, so-and-so lived such and such years, and he died. So-and-so lived so many years, and he died. He said, just the realization that I'm going to live so many years and die, and I'm not ready for that. That scripture was profitable to teach the doctrine. It was profitable for that reproof because that man was living in pride of, I don't need God. That scripture reproved him. It showed him where he was wrong. It corrected him. It showed him what was right. And then the instruction in righteousness was that by which how to do the right, coming to Christ. And so when we look at this, all Scripture is profitable for doctrine. There is nothing from Genesis to Revelation that is not profitable to us for doctrine. Now, what is doctrine? I wish we had time to go through it. But even just, um, if you would, go through 2 Timothy and just look at the times that doctrine are there. Just look it up and say, you know, doctrine, the word doctrine in 2 Timothy. And study the passage to talk about doctrine in Titus. Uh, for all through, we wish we had time to go through it, but but he said it's profitable for doctrine. Okay, doctrine's important. Doctrine is very important. Um, we could wear a shirt that says Jesus loves you, and we're going to get heathens to say, "Hey, nice shirt." You know, we're we're going to get. Um, I'll just say that real quickly. But I could wear a shirt that says Jesus loves you, and a homosexual is going to say, "Hey, like your shirt." Okay. Uh, I could say Jesus loves you and somebody who is living an immoral life say, hey, I like your shirt, or, or Jesus forgives, something like that. But when it comes down to the doctrine, that's what people don't like. At work the other night, I was witnessing to a guy, and um, I could tell that he was under the influence. And uh, I said, you know, what have you been doing? He said, I was smoking weed. I said, okay. I said, when are you going to start walking? I've witnessed to this guy so many times. I said, when are you going to start walking with God? He said, I am. I said, no, you're not. So you're smoking weed, you're not walking with God. So I begin to question some other areas of life and say, well, when was the last time you did this? Well, you know, and he, and he told me. I said, would you say that you were walking with God when you did that? Oh, absolutely, I was walking with God. You know what he liked? He liked the idea of not having to go to hell. He liked the idea that Jesus takes our pain, takes our shame. He likes the idea of a friend. He likes the idea of not being scared of a judgment. But you know what he doesn't like? doesn't like doctrine. He doesn't like the fact that 1 John says those who walk in sin don't know God. Those that do sin are of the devil. He didn't like the fact that those who abide in Christ, the Bible says, don't walk in sin. It's the doctrine that he didn't like. So many people that would say, oh yeah, Jesus loves you. It's doctrine they don't like. The fact that we need to repent of our sin. That we can't walk in sin and walk with God. And it's that doctrine that we hate. And Paul calls us here to doctrine. He calls us to doctrine. 
We can look at someone and we can say, well, at least they said Jesus loves you. Okay, that's fine, right? Um, churches are full of lost people, and that's fine. But he calls us on to doctrine. He calls us to sound doctrine. He calls us um, to rebuking. He calls us to all scripture. He calls us to taking all scripture and applying it to all life. Okay? Could you imagine in Titus, as Paul writes to Titus, or even Timothy here in these epistles, and, and he goes through, man, in Timothy, he talks about um, different roles of men and women. He talks about um, how to endure hardness, how to endure affliction. He goes through um, how, how Timothy should behave himself in the house of God. In Titus, he goes through uh, qualifications for deacons and pastors. It says, go lay in order these things, set in order. He tells in Titus 1, he tells them to rebuke them sharply because they're heeding fables instead of the truth. So he goes through all these things. He talks about widows, all that he talks about, how we ought to care. Could you imagine if Titus just walked into that church or if Paul just walked into Corinth and said, hey, Jesus loves you guys. They needed reproof. They needed doctrine. They needed sound teaching of the Bible. And so if Titus would have walked in, this letter, he's supposed to ordain elders, deacons, supposed to do all these things, and he walks in, and he said, hey, Jesus loves you, Jesus forgives you. I'm not going to get into that area of your life because I don't want to be hateful. You know, if that's your truth, if you know, that's fine. You just, you do you, but Jesus loves you. Where's the doctrine? Okay, what that produces is a bunch of people who are heeding false teaching, who have itching ears, and they're just heaping to themselves false teachers. But Paul calls us to doctrine. He calls us to look in the scriptures, come to it. What does God have to say about this in my life? I'm going to submit to that because it is the truth, and then I'm going to apply it to my life. Whether it's marriage or finances or things we do, things we don't do, whatever it may be, we come to it. All of it is profitable for doctrine. There's not a portion of scripture you can read that there's no profit for doctrine, that there's nothing in it you can say, I believe such and such because this is what the Bible says right here. Right? All the things I could ask what we believe as Christians about marriage, where do we get that? from all over Scripture, from in the Word of God. But that's the authority. That's where we come back to. The next thing he says, all Scripture is given uh, profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Reproof is just showing us where we're wrong. Okay, All Scripture is profitable for that. You can read about Samson. You can say, man, you know, I've been going places I shouldn't go to. I've been hanging out with people I shouldn't hang out with too. And there's some reproof there. We can look at Solomon and we can be like, man, you know, I'm letting my heart be turned away. From the things of God. And we can look at Demas. We can read how he forsook Paul, having loved this present world. You can say, Man, how have I been loving the world recently? All scriptures for reproof. Okay? All Genesis, Revelation, anywhere you read, there's going to be reproof, but not just that correction. Correction is going to not just show us, reproof is going to show us the wrong, correction is going to show us the right. Okay? It's going to show us the mirror image. And then the instruction in righteousness is just how to do the right. Okay? So it, the Word of God, it's going to show us what to believe, it's going to show us where our thoughts are wrong, where we're wrong. It's going to show us what the right thing is, and then it's going to instruct us in the right thing. And that's what the Word of God does for us. God doesn't leave us alone. God's not like a terrible pilot teacher who gets you up in the airplane for the first time. He says, hey, you're up in the air. See you later, and jumps out. He gives us, he gives us a word, right? He gives us, say, the, the landing manual, you might say, for the rest of the flight. God gives it to us, and it's profitable for these things. The reason, he says, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Christian maturity comes from profiting in the scriptures. Christian maturity comes in knowing the word of God. He says, he may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Truly furnished. You take a house, maybe it's just on the market, you just buy it. What is it? It's empty, right? Um, nothing in there. There might be cabinets in the kitchen, a bathtub and a toilet in the, in the uh, bathroom, but there's nothing. What do you got? You got to furnish it. You got to bring in, you got to make it a home. You got to make it comfortable. Bring in the chair, bring in the table, bring in the bed. Truly furnished. And that's what the Bible says the Word of God will do for us. It'll truly furnish us unto all good works. It'll show us the things in the light. It'll give us what we need to believe about different things. When the world says, hey, this is okay, we come back to the doctrine and we say, what does the Bible say? What does the scripture? We search it cover to cover. Say, what does the Bible say about this thing? And then we move on and we say, man, I was wrong in that area. Here's what's right. And here's how we need to apply that right, that instruction in righteousness. We move on. And that perfects us. It matures us in Christ because it's the working of God in us. Changing us, making us, teaching us, guiding us in the scriptures. God's Holy Spirit, the Bible says, uh, Jesus said in John, 
He said, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Jesus said in John 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Guys, we're blessed. We've got the truth of God. We've got God's Spirit, God himself indwelling us, guiding us through that truth. We're good to go if we would just submit to it. In Hebrews 4, uh, verse 12, the Bible says, The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So many times we come to the Bible as though I'm the one that's alive, as though I'm the one that's powerful, and I'm going to discern it according to my intents and my thoughts. But that'll mess us up. That'll confuse us. That's why we have so much bad doctrine going around, is because we're coming as though I'm the discerner, of its thoughts and its intents. I'm coming with my thoughts, my intents, and reading it in. But as I was looking at it last night, the Word of God is the quick one. It's the one that's alive. It's the living Word. It's the powerful Word that comes to us, and it's a discern of the thoughts and intents of our heart. It's a blessing that the job's not up to us to know what the Word of God says. God is going to show us through His Spirit. He's going to explain it. He's going to open it to us if we'll just submit to what the Scriptures say. I failed to look at my clock when I started, so I'll just finish up real quick with this. Read through 2 Timothy 3. He's talking about in the last days how perilous times are going to come, how men are going to be lovers of their own selves more than lovers of God. We see that today, right? Even in churches, people, every time we give in a sin, we're loving pleasure more than loving God. Because the Bible says that the love of God is to keep his commandments. He said, it, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is the love of God, is when we obey him and follow him. Anytime we give into that sin, it talks about unholy people. It talks about unthankful people. It talks about uh, truce breakers. It talks about covetous people, boasters, all that we can see in the world around us. Saying, yeah, we're in the last days. He talks about how um, he mentions the two magicians that withstood Moses in verse 8, Janus and Jambres, how they withstood Moses. And people are going after that same lifestyle as Moses is expounding the truth and showing the freedom of God's people. And they're coming in trying to tear that down. And up until this point, we don't know their names. It just says magicians in Exodus. But just remember, God doesn't forget when we go against him. God's not going to forget that. History may forget it, but God always calls it back to mind for judgment. When he talks about how they will proceed no further. He's talking about a day, even though the world's going this way, heeding false doctrine, heaping to themselves teachers uh, that just teach what they want to hear. Because let's be honest, if I had a problem with a particular sin and a preacher stood up, and, and preached and said, that's okay. And then someone stood up and confronted me with the word of God and said, no, that's not okay. According to my lust, which one am I going to want to listen to more? I want to go with the one who says I can keep living the way that I want to live. But that's living according to the lust of the flesh. That's loving the world, and God calls us away from that. But what I want to end with is there in 2 Timothy 3, Paul goes through, hey, people are departing, evil men waxing worse and worse, deceiving, being deceived. There's this this coming away from sound doctrine, coming away from the faith, coming away from the Word of God. But look at verse um, 14. Timothy says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Verse 15, he told us what those things were. It says the Holy Scriptures. Guys, as the world gets away and continues to go into sin, it's pulling us, it's drawing us. All Scripture. Come back to the Word of God. Let that be our authority. Come back to the Word. Continue in what we've learned. Continue in that doctrine. Letting God reprove us, letting God correct us, let us God show in the righteousness, that we may be perfect, that we can come to maturity in Christ, truly furnished under the good works he's called us to. In Titus, he says one of the things that the grace of God does, it teaches us uh, to deny the ungodliness, the worldly lust, to make us zealous of good works. And as we get in the word of God, as we submit to it, not trying to put my thoughts into it, but letting it change me, as the authority that it is, as the word of God, he's exalted higher than even his name. Continue in that. Don't let the world pull us away to something else. Don't let the world pull us away to some other doctrine. If it's not in the Bible, throw it out. If it disagrees with scripture, throw it out. We don't need it. We need the word of God. That's what he's given us from Genesis to Revelation, and it's profitable. And we need, we need all the scriptures. And we have it. God's preserved it for us graciously, so live in it. Let that be our meat. Job said he has seen the word of God more than his necessary food. If we would have that kind of desire and hunger for the word of God, our world wouldn't be in the condition that it is. Everybody, may, everybody else may go astray. Everybody else may buy into false teaching. Everybody else may reject the word of God. But continue thou 
in the things which I've learned, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We've learned the scriptures from the Holy Ghost. We've learned them from God himself as he's imparted them to us, given them by inspiration, and preserved them for us. Coming to the word of God and letting it be our authority.